Thank you, sir. And thank you, Dr. Dhiman and the entire team of CPLD for inviting me and also giving me an opportunity to talk about plasma exchange in acute and chronic liver failure. So this is going to be the outline of my talk. I'll talk about the rationale, mechanism, patient selection, how to decide the exchange volume and the technique. How do you uh, actually can determine the number of sessions in each patient? And very important also for us is to understand the stopping rules for each therapy. Adverse events is something which is very, very relevant when we are using these therapies in the critically ill set of patients and the combination of TPA with other modalities is, which is upcoming and should be explored. So coming to the pathophysiology and all of us know about the acute and chronic liver failure. And again, we can say that there is a predisposition injury response element and an organ failure concept or the pyro concept that can be easily applied to these patients. Now, there is a predisposition of comorbid diseases, there is chronic liver disease, and there is injury due to various insults like alcohol, viruses, drugs in these patients. So where do we actually put in plasma exchange is that the response of these patients is usually determined by the degree and the severity of the systemic inflammation, the toxicity, the immune dysfunction, the bile acids, which is there, the dams, and the endotoxin. And this is where you need a removal strategy so as to make an environment which is conducive for liver regeneration. And what these together, these, the response elements together land up these patients is to lead to organ failures, which are responsible for high mortality. And when we again discuss these organ failures, and while we're using this plasma exchange, it is also important for us to understand in which set of organ failures you can use plasma exchange. So kidneys and brain are two organs of utility where you can also consider a liver transplant, and these are the same organs where you can revive them by using this therapy in these patients. So the goals of liver support for any instance, because plasma exchange is a liver support therapy, we need to bridge these patients. So our goals are either to achieve a spontaneous recovery because we know there is a reversibility in acute and chronic liver failure, or to bridge them to a liver transplant. And whether we can use this as a rescue therapy is still very preliminary, but yes, again, in a very select group of population, we can also explore the benefits of managing the refractory organ failures. So the mechanism basically is, when we understand acute and chronic liver failure, it's a systemic inflammation, and all this, the circulatory dysfunction which is seen in these patients is due to uh, NO-mediated vasodilatation, the mitochondrial dysfunction concept, and the loss of the uh, bioenergy of these cells. This is very upcoming in this area. And this is where something we need to explore the benefits of these therapies. And of course, the immunopathology that is driven by systemic inflammation. And as I already mentioned, there is a lot of toxins which accumulate. We, we usually measure, and most of us have started to measure even bile acids in these patients to understand the degree and the severity of the colomic organ dysfunction that is there. Ammonia is a marker, a much more marker, not just a neurotoxin, but it also correlates with the severity of inflammation in these patients, the lactates, and all these uh, parameters can actually be, be handled by using these artificial liver support therapies. Now, how plasma exchange? And when we are planning to use plasma exchange, we should be knowing our patient, and we should be knowing what are we planning to remove. So when we talk about liver failure, there are protein-bound and water-soluble toxins. So when you use your hemofiltration, hemodialysis, or CRRT, you're not able to remove the larger protein-bound toxins. So plasma exchange, in a way, is a more effective therapy for management of patients with acute and chronic liver failure. Now, this is the data from ARC, which we recently published. And in this, this was a retrospective analysis of the prospectively collected data in the ARC consortium. And what we did here was we stratified these patients based on whether they were managed with standard medical treatment, the liver dialysis, which was Prometheus, and these were the predominant population at ILBS, and plasma exchange patients managed at different Asian Pacific centers. So what we found was, yes, the standard medical treatment did not show much difference when we analyzed all patients, but when we did a propensity score matched analysis. So we found that patients who were actually given the liver failure supportive care, they were very different in the way that they were having more HE, 
They were more stable patients, but were having higher MEL scores. They were less sepsis in this group. So we did a propensity risk score match analysis. And in this set of matched population, we found that there was some difference and plasma exchange or even Prometheus was better as compared to the standard medical treatment. So patient selection is very important. But again, here, it, there were more infections with patients who underwent liver dialysis. And when you compare patients with, uh, treated with plasma exchange and liver dialysis, we found that plasma exchange was more effective and a safer therapy as compared to liver dialysis, and obviously better than the standard medical treatment. So coming to the patient selection, and again, I'll take you to the concept which has been proposed by the APSL of the golden window. So the earlier you recognize your patient of acute and chronic liver failure who has developed liver failure, but not develop the extra hepatic organ failures, but should not be the ones who have responded to standard medical treatment. So it is not that every patient should be selected for this therapy. So you should have some factors. And what we can use as factors to understand in this set of patients is the non-response to standard medical treatment, the presence of systemic inflammatory response syndrome, the worsening of ascites, non-response to diuretics, which can all tell us that this patient has not stopped responding, is prone to develop AKI and other organ dysfunction. And this is where you should start using these therapeutic modalities before list and start counseling them simultaneously for a liver transplant, which is very important. And if you do them late after the golden window, that is after the organ failures have already developed, the chances of spontaneous reversal of the liver function are less. But here the goals remain to see whether you can bring bridge these patients to a liver transplant because they need time to get the live donors and you need to uh, save these patients from going into refractory organ failures. So how do we decide the exchange volume, the number of sessions and stopping rules? Now the challenges with TP is that and for any uh, removal strategy is that it is not selective. So when you do this therapy, you want your bilirubin to go down, your ammonia to go down, but everything will come out. So you will remove your antibiotics also, you will remove all the good factors, the growth factors will also be removed, the coagulation factors will also be removed. So all this lands up in problems in these patients also. So you have to be very careful. And that's why the technique of whether to be using a high volume technique, if you use more volumes, there are more challenges of you removing these factors, more cell problems with the volumes and more challenges which are faced. So low volume, or a standard volume technique is better when you're doing plasma exchange in patients with acute and chronic liver failure. This is the data for acute liver failure. And we showed here that if you compare plasma exchange with standard medical treatment, yes, you want all your pro-inflammatory factors to improve, your anti-inflammatory factors show improvement. But look at this, the growth factors are also decreased. So standard medical treatment patients who were treated with this, the growth factors remained elevated, but when you're treating these patients with repeated plasma exchanges, you're also washing away the important growth factors. So therefore, we should not be doing the number of sessions, and this is where it is very important as clinicians that we should decide what should be the number of sessions after doing a good patient selection and timing of uh, how to proceed with therapy. So important concept here is that it's a non-linear relationship. So why the concept of three has come? Because if you do three sessions, it, is, it removes the 70% of the bound toxins which you're planning to remove. But this may not be true for patients with acute and chronic liver failure because they are dynamic and you're removing a lot of other factors, the coagulation factors, and they may not tolerate this therapy if you keep on doing it for three sessions. So it is very important to do a response assessment. And for response ass assessment, this is just to show you the data again. This is from the ARC consortium in a set of very small five patients. What we did was to look at the detailed set of cytokines, pro and anti-inflammatory and growth factors. And we see here that patients who were responders, that is the patients who had a 28-day survival without liver transplant with plasma exchange compared to patients who were treated with standard medical treatment. If you see here, both showed reduction in the pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory and the growth factors. But what stood out over here was the levels of IL-1 receptor antagonist, which was much higher in the patients who were responding to the therapy. So this could be, again, validated in a larger set of patients as a biomarker of response. We also looked at the monocyte function, and we found that, that the patients who had response, they had improvement in the monocyte function, 
And also in the mitochondrial function, when we did a, a by, when we did the bioanalyzer using the seahorse assay, we showed that there was an improvement in the mitochondrial function in the monocytes. And this is a clinical model because we cannot do these important experiments till we get them into the clinical practice. What is the clinical way to stratify which patient would respond and which will not respond to your therapy? And this we presented this year in ASLD as a poster paper. And what we did here was there were 100 patients who were critically ill admitted to the ICU who all underwent plasma exchange prospectively. We, we had actually analyzed the data and we see here that if you have a response to therapy the, and the response in this set of patients we decided based on the improvement and the uh, stoppage of the norepinephrine, all these patients had milder degrees of shock and the improvement in the lactate levels. And in this set of patients, we found that a MEL score about 36 and grade four a hepatic encephalopathy and two or more organ failures. So if a patient had two or more organ failures, these were the ones who were not responding to therapy. And again, you have to be very cautious in this set of patients. And the other important factor was the sepsis-driven organ failure, where there was a 100% non-response. So sepsis, already where the sepsis has set in, plasma exchange should not be tried. So when we looked at the predictors, we found that only in the ICU setting, in the critically ill set, 30% of the total percentage of the population responded to the therapy. The non-response, as I already mentioned, was determined by the number type and also whether the organ failure was sepsis-driven or inflammation-driven. And a higher lactate was also an important marker, which told us that the plasma exchange may not work for your patient. This is uh, from CMC Velour in patients with alcoholic hepatitis, another very sick group of patients. And here again, they showed that if you give plasma exchange and then subsequently treat them with low dose steroids, 20 mg for two weeks, followed by 10 mg for two weeks, you can achieve a good response. And this they compared with the standard medically treated patients. And again, von Willebrand factor could be another biomarker which showed which could be a marker of endothelial injury. And as I told that inflammation drives endothelial injury and plasma exchange is improving inflammation. The von Willebrand factor showed reduction in all the treated patients but it remained elevated in the non-survivors as compared to the survivors. This is data which Akash had already shown. And I just will talk about very briefly about the type of kidney dysfunction also, which can determine the response to plasma exchange. And when you see the postmortem kidney biopsies of patients of ACLF who are dying with stage 3 AKI, two distinct phenotypes are seen. So colimic nephropathy and acute tubular necrosis. And majority of these patients have colimic organ dysfunction, 54%. And 15% had a combination. So it is unusually different. What we expect is every patient who's dying of shock should have acute tubular necrosis. But what we found here was most of these patients had colimic nephropathy. And if you compare the outcomes of plasma exchange in colimic organ dysfunction versus ATN, the two phenotypes of structural AKI, we see here that ATN patients have worsening of endotoxemia, worsening of the vasodilatation because of the worsening in the uh, ENOS levels and lower reduction of ferritin. So again, the, di the distinct phenotyping of the kidneys is also very important if you have renal dysfunction using plasma exchange. Adverse events, I already spoke about the, the differences between liver diseases and plasma exchange. We see here the most of the Adverse effects are much well tolerated as compared to liver dialysis, where the, the severity and the degree of adverse effects were more. And again, there is an upcoming therapy we, which we are using now very commonly in our patients, the cytokine heme absorption. It's a much more safer modality, and this is the randomized control trial from our center where we showed that if we use heme absorption in these patients, the incidence of adverse effects related to the lung, the shift to the ICU and HDU, the infections all were less uh, with heme absorption when compared to plasma exchange. So in a sicker set where I showed where the patient is less likely to respond, maybe a heme absorption therapy is something which can be used. And again, if you look at the mass spec data of bile acids here, the heme absorption therapy and the plasma exchange both showed reduction at day four, day seven, but there was again a rebound increase in the plasma exchange but a sustained reduction in the bile acids noted with heme absorption therapy. Combination is the last part of my talk. I will, uh, we showed data in a three level failure. If you use CRRT alone, the outcomes in, with respect to clearance of lactate, ammonia, 
funding improvement in mean arterial pressure is much lower, but if you use and combine it with plasma exchange, the outcomes are much better. And this is the trial which we're currently conducting. We already enrolled 40 patients in this trial. And in acute and chronic liver failure, as I showed you, colonic oil dysfunction responds better. Start early these therapies at lower male scores, and if you use a combination of plasma exchange and CRRT, it is better than using either therapy alone. And this is the management algorithm which we published. And this is based on Melvin Arc scoring. If you have your patient with ACL, you see here, you can also achieve spontaneous survival if you're using this therapy timely. If you're using with single organ failure, kidneys and brain other organs, circulation, respiration, and more than two organ failures, it is better not to use plasma exchange. So I would like to summarize by saying that plasma exchange may be an effective bridging therapy in patients with acute and chronic liver failure to liver transplant and spontaneous recovery as well, but we need RCTs in this in area. Combinations should also be explored. And again, head-to-head -head trials with other therapies which are much more safer in the sicker group. And a lot of data needs to be generated again from different centers about the timing, the patient select outcomes, and the disease-specific etiology-based outcomes which should be evaluated. Thank you.